Hello and welcome back to the Goodness Lover Show. Today we're joined by Joseph Pizzano, who has been a naturopathic doctor for no less than 50 years. He's the co-founder of Bastia University. He's a textbook encyclopedia writer and a wealth of knowledge. We'll be talking about the forgotten molecules that are actually key in supporting our immune system and are critical in protecting us from disease. Let's get into it. Dr. Joseph Pizzano, we are so grateful to have you on the show with us. We've actually um, been a fan of your work for a while, and I know you've prolifically published um, many handbooks and, and textbooks that are used actually in naturopathic training. So it's actually a great honor to have you on our show for the first time. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you. So today we have some very interesting new research that I know you were just bursting at the seams to tell us about when we were off air before. So what is this about these exciting molecules that have may maybe been forgotten about? Well, thank you for the introduction. So one of my roles in life these days seems to be to look at a lot of research and compare it to my patient experiences and see if I can come up with some themes that make sense for people. You know, I mainly teach doctors these days, but sometimes I talk to consumers. So as I look at research, I started noticing this pattern starting to notice this pattern of people being really excited about all these phytonutrients. You know, per person has a disease, we give them a phytonutrient, we call it a polyphenol or things of this nature, and it's good benefits. And as I was, I was looking at that, I was thinking, yeah, that's pretty interesting. But wait a minute, aren't these supposed to be in the food anyway? So then I started looking at food and what's in food and looking at food that's chemically grown and compared to food that's organically grown. And then I started noticing there's a big difference. It's not, and it's, while the vitamins and minerals aren't that different, there's other molecules that are different. So I thought back to myself, so 100 years ago, when we first started doing research, it was very complex. We were dependent upon animals and we we're dependent upon simplification. So we did a bunch of simplification and one of the most critical simplifications we did in doing the early nutrition research was to only look at those nutrients that made the difference between life and death. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And we come up with vitamins and minerals and fatty acids and amino acids, and it turns out there are 43 molecule, molecules and minerals we decide were important. And therefore, everything else was unimportant. So I just completed a major new lecture, which I facetiously titled, unimportant molecules, okay, because they're inside, they're unimportant, so it's okay for them to leave the food supply. But we now suffer the highest burden of chronic disease in every age group ever in human history. Something's wrong. Now, I've been studying very deeply how environmental metals and chemicals, these toxins, are causing disease. But I'm starting to think possibly even, even as important as these toxins as the loss of these other molecules from the food supply, which I'm facetiously saying, unimportant molecules. Mm -hmm. So these unimportant molecules, uh, where, you know, where do we find them? And, um, what you know, are they? what are they? Because I'm, I'm very <laughs> right. interested. In what are them. we missing, Dr. Yeah. Bazzano? <laughs> Let me tell you about a study that just came out two days ago. Uh, it was done by a friend of mine in Italy, a, a researcher in natural products, a PhD. And he does not only kind of, I say, laboratory research, he also does clinical research. And he hypothesized, we had, we had talked about this about a year ago, he said, well, look at this um, SARS-CoV-2, I would think that bioflavonoids would make it harder to infect humans and then protect the humans who are infected. And the one which he thought was most important of these flavonoids was quercetin. So in a study in Italy, they took 150 people who were uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected, so COVID-19, they gave half of them placebo and half of them one of these unimportant molecules named quercetin, okay? And then they tracked them over several months, and they found that those given the quercetin had 80% fewer in hospital admissions, serious sequelae, deaths, et cetera, from COVID-19. Now, why would quercetin protect us from COVID-19? Well, let's go back to the plants. Why do plants produce molecules other than vitamins and minerals? To protect themselves. 
remember, plants are susceptible to viruses and bacteria and insects and predation by you know, animal species, including humans. Uh, they get cancer from this too much ultraviolet from the sun. So they produce a bunch of these molecules to protect themselves. And when we eat those molecules, we protect ourselves as well. The problem is when you grow foods chemically in a chemically protected environment where you're spraying them with all these pesticides and other kinds of poisons, yes, allows the food to grow, but now the food no longer produces these molecules. You might be asking yourself, okay, well, you just told me that a little bit less than 50 molecules were necessary for health. How many molecules are in food? 50,000. So we've decided, we've decided that 99.9% of the molecules in food are unimportant. But it turns out when you do, there's now study after study showing when people have less of these molecules, they've got more disease. Yeah, they didn't die, but they're not healthy anymore. What is it about chemically grown produce that makes these uh, important? I'm going to call them important <laughs> molecules disappear <laughs> yeah. from our food supply. So there, there are a number of ways that this happens. So first off, if you're spraying the plants all the time with these anti-insect agents, et cetera, well, they're not going to have to protect themselves as much because the chemicals are doing it. That's one factor. But there's another factor, and that's things like glyphosate. Now, we spray glyphosate on foods. To, as an herbicide, so we don't have to don't have to weed, and we figure glyphosate is okay because there's no obvious pathway in humans that's damaged by it. But when you spray it on the plants, it makes them produce less of these other molecules because it poisons a key pathway called the shipment pathway that's involved in producing many of these other molecules. It's not only that, but also when you put the glyphosate on the soil and now disrupts the microbiome of the soil, and the plants don't produce any bioflavonoids either because they can't, because the soil's been messed up. Interesting. So basically, um, just for uh, you know, some of our listeners to get their head around this. So, and ourselves. And ourselves, <laughs> speaking for a friend. <laughs> so basically, as we experience some form of uh, you know, stress, the, our body reacts to it. So you're saying basically that plants, when they get extremely cold or they, uh, they're threatened by something, they reach down into the nutrients of the soil and they then produce these molecules that protect themselves. And then by right. eating those molecules, we then protect ourselves. We get the benefits of exactly. what, basically the, the hard, hard work, work the that these plants did. have gone through. <laughs> so what's happened is by removing these molecules from the food supply, these natural antiviral, antibacterial, anti-cancer, you name it, anti-bad thing, uh, these molecules are gone. Maybe there's maybe something, isn't there, uh, is it, uh, it's uh, resveratrol in grapes? Resveratrol. So that's, that's been studied a lot as a um, anti-aging capability. Yes. Can you explain yes. ex briefly about that, please? Well, there, there are a number of mechanisms by which it works, but in general, it stimulates something called the sirtuins, and the sirtuins um, help reverse a number of the uh, aging changes that, that happen in cells. So resveratrol starts protecting from that. And so everybody's aware of resveratrol and wine because it's a high source. It's not the only place with resveratrol. It's a bunch of other foods if they're grown organically. So let me show you a slide. Okay, so this is looking at organically grown foods versus chemically grown foods. Now, one of the challenges when trying to compare organically versus chemically grown, and by the way, they normally say organically versus conventionally grown. So I'm, I'm not using the term conventionally grown anymore because I want organic to become conventionally grown. So I'm saying chemically awesome. grown foods. Okay. So one of the challenges to make sure you've got a really good study, you have to make sure the same seeds, the same sunlight, same water, same dirt. The only difference is what fertilizers are being put on it. So this study was done in a greenhouse with tomatoes. They put in everything was the same except the fertilizer. And then they looked at these unimportant molecules throughout the whole year of the growth cycle of the food. And see these blue lines here? For those who can't see it, the blue lines are really high. And then you've got the red lines. Look, not only are they dramatically lower, in many situations, they're not even there. Wow. So what's happened is we've, when we've chemically modified the food supply, we have tend to maintain those molecules that give us the color of the food and a little bit of its taste, but everything else is gone. 
Now look at this one, Florton. You might say, well, why might that be important? Okay, look, it's, it's virtually gone. Um, so Florton is one of these flavonoids. I never heard of it before, um, but as I was studying, I was just paying attention. And then a couple months ago, a student at Bastyr University came to me and said, Dr. Pizorno, I just love your work in environmental medicine. Uh, can I see some patients with you? I said, well, you know, I'm not seeing very many patients these days. I only, I only see like a half a dozen patients a year. My job right now is to look at the research and figure out what it means. So, so I said, if you want to work with me, you know, I'll give you a research project. She, she said, well, sure, I'd love to do that. So I said, something I'm noticing in the environmental toxins, we were very aware of the problem with lead. So we stopped putting lead in gasoline, things like that. And we were aware of DDT and we were at PCBs. They were all banned 40, 50 years ago. Good. But now let's look at the research on arsenic. And it looks like arsenic is actually worse than lead. Why aren't we banning arsenic? Um, for example, arsenic looks like it causes one quarter to one third of the major cancers. You know, like lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer. I mean, these are the cancers that tend to kill people. I'm saying, well, if it's doing this much damage, why aren't we doing something about it? So I said, I want you to look and see, are there any molecules in the food supply that protect us from arsenic? Because in the back of my mind, I was thinking, boy, I wonder if those molecules have left the food supply, and that's why we're more toxic. Well, arsenic is more toxic. So she went back and started looking at the food supply, and guess what? This uh, biflavonoid right here protects our DNA from the damage from arsenic. Because what happens is arsenic damages our DNA, makes us get cancer. And normally we get protected from the arsenic when we're eating foods with molecules like this in it. But the molecules aren't, aren't in the food anymore. So now we're seeing an interaction between not only ever increasing levels of metals and chemicals in the environment, with some successes, lead's gone down, which is good, but there's 50,000 other molecules, uh, other, Interesting, there are 50,000 other chemicals. Interesting parallel. <laughs> okay, I never made that parallel before. But anyway, there are a lot of these other toxins in the environment that are all going up, okay? And in the context of people not eating food, that's lost the molecules in the foods that would normally protect us from these toxins. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, I know that the Environmental Working Group has gotten a little bit of, I guess, flack lately with their Dirty Dozen Clean 15. I see a lot of comments going, don't you know this is debunked? It doesn't matter if it's organically grown or chemically grown. Like, Well, they would say conventionally grown. It's hard because I guess in the literature, it's hard to do human studies because you can't give people poison. You know what I mean? And so, right, right. Um, but I guess this aspect is completely missed as well, like the protective effects of having food the way it's supposed right. to be. So thank you for bringing that to light. I'd love to know a bit more about how is this actually working? How do these, once we ingest, say, a, a, a polyphenol, what is mm -hmm. it about it that has such protective effects once it gets inside? Okay, so here's another category of these, you know, <laughs> what we're calling um, phytonutrients, okay? So these are these are these category called terpenoids, and lemony is one of them. I'm going to show you something about that later on. Okay, so look at look at all these things these molecules do: anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, promote respiratory tract and function, pr function, uh, anti-cancer, uh, improve uh, mitochondrial function. There's all these examples of these molecules promoting foundational physiological processes in our body, and they're gone or dramatically decreased. So Dr. Pisano, I'm very curious. We know that um, you know, things like wheat and in the, even the design of the actual food pyramid has been very influenced by big food. Um, I'm curious to know what's happened to you know, wheat as we had used it for thousands of years to now what it is now and that impact and what we're losing from the food quality. Yeah, great question. So think about this. As you force a food to produce more of one particular molecule, molecule, like wheat, we want wheat to have a lot of protein in it. Well, then of course, the plant's gonna produce less of everything else because we decided they're not, it was not important. So let's look at the slide. So this slide is comparing ancient Kamut to current wheat, okay? This was, this was done, this is in humans. All these studies I, I'll, I'll be showing you are all done in humans. So this crossover study, which means uh, the humans got one version for a period of time, then had a washout period, then got the other version, and they compared it before and after. 
And what did they find? First off, the ancient commute was much higher and these nutrients we know are important, like zinc, 67%, 64% higher in zinc. And then we look at the physiological effects. And what do you see when people are eating ancient kamut versus current wheat? You see dramatically lower inflammation. You see dramatically uh, higher levels of chemicals that uh, kill cancer. Um, you see lower levels of cholesterol, lower levels of blood sugar. I mean, across the board, all these parameters of health get better when eating the ancient, ancient wheat compared to eating the current wheat. There's example after example of when you look at the food before it's been modified with chemical uh, chemical growth being far healthier than after it's been modified by chemical growth. Fascinating. So mm. we're obviously seeing a cascading effect or a compounding effect of destroying not only, you know, with some of these pesticides, destroying our microbiome, we're destroying the microbiome of the soil. We're also then modifying these plants to, um, you know, obviously make them more productive. And then you're saying that once we spray them again, we also then lose nutrient factors from them. So if you're not convinced you should be eating organic right crazy. now, <laughs> what are we doing? I'm not sure what will, what will well, convince let, you let, let me ask to go this. Further. Organically grown with heirloom seeds. Because remember, as we hybridize the seeds to get more of something that we want, we're getting less of everything else. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I guess we didn't really think of the trade-off. We're just like more of the, more, get it bulkier, get it more of the yeah, gluten. That, yeah. right, bigger and sweeter and brighter yeah. and all those things. Yeah, nice. But you're losing something. And we've yeah. done so much of it, we've lost a huge amount of important molecules for our bodies. So our, these, you know, these allies of fighters that we have that we can eat from our friends from the plants, um, how, what, you know, obviously in this very polluted society, I know we touched on it before, um, is there a certain mechanisms that are happening in the body that help us detox these chemicals? So people are like, they're petrified of these chemicals and they all often feel overwhelmed. Yes. And I'm just saying yes. this is an amazing thing these plants are giving us. Can you explain yes. to us and more and some more detail how that detox pathway works? So there, there are many ways in which we detox. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Sid Baker, made a, a, a statement once that 25% of the energy produced in our body is used for detoxification. Now, when you think about it, some things are pretty obvious. For example, hormones. You know, the hormones that make, you know, estrogen makes women have all those characteristics that we men like, and that testosterone gives men that those characteristics that women like. Well, once they've done the job, how do you get rid of them? And it turns out, if you get rid of them through the wrong pathway, for men, you get more prostate cancer. For women, you get more breast cancer. But if you detoxify them through the right pathway, men get less prostate cancer, women get less breast cancer. As a matter of fact, if you detoxify estrogen through the right pathway, it actually prevents breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So what determines which pathway is dominant in our detoxification processes? These are the molecules in the food supply. So when women, for example, eat cabbage family foods, they upregulate the enzyme that converts estrogen to the least toxic form. So it turns out we, we have a lot of molecules that we produce in the body to have a particular purpose, then you have to get rid of them after you've done that, done that job. So we spend a lot of energy doing this. So not only do we spend a lot of energy doing it, but we have all these enzyme systems. We've got enzyme systems in the gut, in the liver, we got processes in the kidneys, a lot of processes for getting rid of, getting rid of toxins. In general, there's two ways to get rid of a toxin and a third backup method. Mm -hmm. Pathway number one is just get out of the body as easily and quickly as possible. Arctic is an example where we can actually get rid of it pretty quickly. The problem is if we're ex constantly exposed to it and we don't have the flavonoids to protect our, our DNA, well, then arsenic is going to be more damaging. Okay. Other chemicals are harder to break down. So we have to chemically m m modify them in the kidney to either break them down or, the, or make them water soluble to excrete them to the kidneys. Now in the kidneys in general, what the kidneys do is just excrete them. So kidneys just comes by, it's a molecule the body doesn't want, tries to get rid of its physical marilite, put it into urine, get it out of the body. So we have a bunch of different mechanisms and they're all impacted by nutrition, the total load of toxins and unimportant molecules. Mm. Wow. So, um, sorry, so you're saying these unimportant slash very important <laughs> right. molecules. Right. They act as, did you say enzymes or cofactors? How, how so, do they so relate? Many of them, yeah, many of them work with, so either they are used by the enzymes to function properly 
or they are, are induced, they induce the enzymes. So let's okay. think about cabbage for a, for, a, for a second. So cabbage has these things called glucosinolates, which are pretty toxic, they help protect the, the cabbage from insects. So when we eat them, they're toxic for us as well, except we've got these enzymes. Now, the enzymes in the body require a lot of energy, so the body only produces the enzymes when it needs them. Now, the detox enzymes. Now, it's not true. Some detox enzymes always function just fine, but many of them are inducible. They're, the body doesn't produce them until it needs to because it doesn't want to waste the energy. So what cabbage does is induces the enzymes that detoxify estrogen through the optimal pathway. Hmm. Fascinating. Hey. Because, That's yeah, and why is that happening? Because cabbage has stuff that's toxic in it. But right. we as a species evolved the enzymes so that we could eat that cabbage without getting poisoned like the insects are poisoned. Huh. Very interesting. That kind, of, kind of interesting concept, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. totally. Wow. It's like 4D chess almost. It's just like <laughs> how this is working. Like how nature is, is incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. I think our audience would be curious uh, to learn a little bit more about the effect on the mu immune system that these mm. uh, molecules have. Could you tell us a little bit mo more about that? And I guess the specifics of how how that works. Okay. So, of course, I could talk for hours on that. But let me <laughs> just do. Uh, let me just do. Um, give you a little example. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Vitamin C. Everybody knows vitamin C is important. Now, the recommended amounts of vitamin C are typically less than 100 milligrams a day. But as we evolved as a species, we're consuming 500 milligrams a day. So our body adapted to 500 milligrams a day. Now, why is that important for the immune system? Okay, well, vitamin C itself is directly uh, antiviral and antibacterial. Not real strong, but it's directly antibacterial. But there's something else that's really interesting here. Do, do you and your audience know about H. pylori? That was discovered by an Australian, right? H. pylori causing stomach ulcers? Yeah. Right, you all know about that, okay? Yeah. So, what happens if you put a person on a diet with 500 milligrams per day of vitamin C? The H. pylori can't grow in the stomach. Huh. Okay, so we're saying, oh, H. pylori is the cause of stomach ulcers, this bacteria, killed off with antibiotics. But if you consume enough vitamin C, the H. pylori can't grow. So is it the H. pylori or is it the loss of vitamin C from the diet? Well, let's go further. When our, our body's trying to fight off an infection, what typically happens is the white cells engulf, engulf the invading a, a organism, release a bunch of enzymes to break it down and just digest the organism, kill it off. But if you give a person a lot of sugar, the immune system starts to function more poorly. As a matter of fact, you get about 50% reduction in the white cell's ability to engulf and kill off those bacteria. Why might that be? So when you give a person high amounts of sugar, you increase the amount of insulin being secreted. And when the person has high levels of insulin, it impairs the white cell's ability to absorb vitamin C. Why is that important? Because vitamin C in the white cells protect them from the digestive enzymes that they're secreting to kill off the invading organism. So when there's no vitamin C there, the white cells start working more poorly to protect themselves from the digesting themselves instead of just the bacteria. Mm -hmm. okay. So these are subtle effects that are incredibly important. Thank you. Um, before you mentioned how um how these molecules have a protective effect against things like arsenic. So firstly, why is there so much arsenic in our food? And secondly, <laughs> um, how, does, how, how is it protective? Okay, so arsenic is a fascinating toxin. <clears throat> and because we were exposed to it as we evolved as a species, and so we're actually pretty good at getting rid of it. The one way to determine whether we've been exposed to that same molecule or mineral or similar one is what's the half-life in the body. So something like arsenic, two to four days. Now for almost everybody, some people have genetic polymorphism where they have trouble getting rid of arsenic. But other things like these man-made chemicals like DDT, PCBs, they have half-life measured in years to decades because they were designed to be difficult to break down by biological organisms. So the arsenic is normally 
there's, all, there's, there's normally some arsenic in the environment because people drink water. And if the water is coming from an area of rock, you might say, that has arsenic in it, the arsenic will show up in the water. Mm-hmm. So it's not too bad as long as you don't do it all the time. But what happens when, oh, you decide that chickens, in order to make them, uh, to kill off their parasites, in order to get them to plump up and get bigger and have more white meat, which sells for more, well, when you give them arsenical compounds, well, guess what? They get rid of, the ar- get rid of those parasites and they grow and have more white meat. And we humans then eat that arsenic. How about if you grow rice in water that happens to have arsenic in it? Rice is very efficient at absorbing arsenic. How about if you have an old climbing toy in your backyard, this one of those old wood climbing toys where they use wood preservatives on them to keep them from rotting? They're full of arsenic. Not anymore, but up until not that long ago, they were full of arsenic. So old ones are full of arsenic. So those babies, those little children crawl around those those climbing toys, fill themselves full of arsenic. Okay. So what's happened is while we, yes. Now I'll go even further. So in the US, I don't know, I. I I have some numbers in, our, in Australia, but not as good as in the U.S. So in the U.S., 10% of the public water supplies that have reported their arsenic levels have arsenic levels high enough to induce disease in humans. It's a known problem. Now, here's the kicker. Only half of the public water supplies have reported their arsenic levels. Why is that? This is a $50 test. These are multi-million dollar operations. Because if they have high levels of arsenic, they have to remediate it, and it's expensive. So many people are consuming water they think is safe. It actually has high levels of arsenic. We then look at the threshold from which arsenic has to be in a person's body before you start seeing more disease. So it's kind of certain the certain threshold. Then you look at well, how much arsenic is in people in the country? One third of people in the U.S. have arsenic levels known to d- induce disease in humans. One out of three, okay? I can go after toxin after toxin showing you <sighs> huge body loads, huge body loads. And this is for a chemical that we actually detox quite well. So that yes. kind of shows how much we're consuming. That's yeah. crazy. So you do look at things like uh, rheumatoid arthritis in women. Do you want to know what the strongest predictor of rheumatoid arthritis in women is? Mm-hmm. The levels of PCBs in her fat. And Mm. PCBs have half-lives in the body from 2 to 25 years. It takes four half-lives to get something out of the body. So if you go to your local restaurant, some of your restaurant people are going to be mad at me, go to your local restaurant and eat farmed fish, you just put PCBs into your body that may be there for the rest of your life. And if you're a woman, you've just increased your risk of rheumatoid arthritis. Do you want to continue? I mean, you want to get, you want to get depressed? <laughs> the first time I get, Keep going. When, I, when, I my, when I gave my very first lecture on environmental medicine, it was about 10 years ago. At the end of it, uh, I was kind of looking at the stunned audience, and this guy walked up at an MD and said, that was the most depressing lecture I've ever heard. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So, okay. So let's, uh, you know, the um, you would say the hero is returning, detoxing. <laughs> To take us yes. away from this um, very scary thing that you're talking about. I know when yes. we've spoken before, you mentioned sweating. Like, I just want something basic yes. that someone can work on starting tonight um, and mm-hmm. maybe feel like they can get control back of this toxic soup that we're living in. So, yes. talk us, why is sweating important? Ah, great question. <clears throat> so, you know, we've all kind of thought, well, sweating, it ought to be detoxifying, shouldn't it? So, a friend of mine, Dr. Stephen uh, uh, Genuous, up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, um, very, you know, very research oriented kind of guy. He took 10 people, put them in a sauna, uh, had them sweat, scrape up the sweat, measure what was in them. He looked at the sweat, the toxins in their blood, toxins in their sweat, and toxins in the urine. Not only f- did he find dramatically higher levels of many toxins in the sweat, he found toxins in the sweat that weren't in the blood or the urine. So remember way back when I said the body has two ways of getting rid of toxins and a third, much less good way of doing it? So if the body can't excrete it, and if it can't break it down and it's causing damage, it tries to tries to sequester it, tries to stuff it away somewhere where it's not doing too much damage. So we start to sweat, all of a sudden the body says, oh, 
Now I've got some way to get rid of this thing. Because remember, it was designed to be difficult to break down by biological systems. I mean, think about it. If you're going to spray your food supply with a pesticide, you don't want the insects to be able to break it down easily. Okay, so you make it hard to break down. So these things that get stuck in our bodies, sweating is very effective at getting rid of them. Um, a morbid thought. I have heard that because of all these types of things that we ingest, our bodies actually don't break down post-death in the way they used to. Is that correct, Dr. Pisano? Have you heard oh. about how um, in morgues, the time that it takes for a human to break down is so much longer than it used to be just because we're full of preservatives? <laughs> anyway. I, need, I need to fact check that. Yeah, that's but, um, that's, that's sort of interesting. I'll have to see if there's any research. <laughs> That, that would be a great addition to one of my lectures. <laughs> so tell us about, uh, we know the Nordic countries particularly love saunas. Uh, is there any interesting research that's come out of those countries about tons, how good saunas are? Tons of research. And here's the fascinating thing about it. So because saunas are so common in Finland where they do the research, uh, a lot of the research has been done there, they compare people who do saunas once a week to those who do saunas two to three times a week to those who do saunas four or more times per week. Okay, so we're not comparing people to no saunas to those who are doing one sauna or multiple saunas. So let's compare one sauna a week to four or more a week. 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease, 40% reduction in Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really clear. When you do saunas, you get rid of the toxins and you're healthier. And, oh, and by the way, let me add something to this. Let me add something. So one of the things I, so when I first heard Siva Genuis give this in a lecture, and I've since had a chance to sit down and talk with him quite a lot. Anyway, I said, well, it doesn't matter how you sweat. His answer was, no, it doesn't matter how you sweat. So if you're an athlete, you go out and do a lot of running. That's what I do. I do a lot of running, sweat, great way to go to toxin. It doesn't matter how you're sweating. You just have to be sweating. Oh, that's a great point. Great for point. those who mm -hmm. feel they don't have a sauna and it might be financially unavailable or um, – you know, it, you don't want to create reasons why you can't start um, doing these detox practices. So that's right. great. Right. Yeah, I think it's important as well to notice there that, you know, certain activities are better at sweating than others. So to really think about some of those activities that make you sweat. For example, swimming is a great cardiovascular exercise, but maybe you don't, you don't, the I know. Water, you don't, remember, yeah. that there's a lot of chemicals in the water. I mean, I, mm. if, you, if you swim in fresh water, way better than a, sw a swimming pool with lots of chemicals mm. in it. Wait, 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 one more slide. One more slide I want to show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's bring this one up. Okay, so this is limonene. Remember, I showed you that uh, diagram or that which showed some of the benefits of limonene. Limonene is profoundly anti cancer. Here's a slide shows around 20 different pathways that, are, that result in cancer that are blocked by limonene. You know what's happening now? Cancer researchers are now chemically modifying the limonene to make it patentable, and then they give it back to people to treat their cancer. So you have a situation where we re remove an unimportant molecule from the food supply, people get cancer, we then take one of those molecules that we removed from the food supply, chemically modify it, and then give it back to people at very high cost to treat the condition caused by losing that molecule. Does that make sense? It does, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, yes, for the profit driven only, yes. <laughs> so what uh, types of food would lim uh, oh, what is it, limonene be in? So it's, it's, it's in real whole foods, pure and simple. The more whole mm -hmm. food, you know, clearly, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, citrus fruits and things like that, there's, it's going to be there. But there's a number of foods that have limonene. And remember, when we talk about one molecule being so great. Remember, there's 50,000 of them. Yeah. Don't, don't expect to get all the benefit by saying, oh, I got to make sure I got plenty of quercetin or I got plenty of limonene. Well, fine. But how about the other 50,000? Okay. Yeah. So that's why you, you need to eat real food. So I was just thinking, this really comes back to the topsoil, really, in the sense that we're destroying our topsoil through over farming and modern day agriculture. So if someone was to start a, um, we've got to, I've got to eat organic, but maybe that organic food doesn't have the mineral, like the soil has been stripped of, um, right. of its essential nut nutrients and minerals that these plants need. Can we grow our own food in our backyard? And if we, you know, maybe control our soil quality better? Is that potentially better as well to, um, you know, increase our food quality? So an anecdote. So I was lecturing in uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, <clears throat> a few years ago with one of my graduates, Dr. Gaetano Morello. Uh, very interesting fellow, um, has hospital privileges at, in Vancouver, British Columbia. 
I mean, he's very, very well respected. And we're having dinner afterwards and we're talking. He said, you know, I've noticed all my own pay, old, all my old patients have their own gardens, growing as much food as they can. I thought that was pretty interesting. I now grow as much of my own food as possible. My wife and I have made a really big commitment to do this. And I can tell you, eat the food from an organic garden, then compare it to organically grown foods bought from a grocery store, and then compare it to chemically grown foods, there's no comparison. The organically grown foods are definitely better than the chemically grown foods, but my foods are way better than the organically grown foods. And how do I define as better? They taste better, not sweeter, they taste better. So when a food tastes, there's, tastes better, or there's more flavor to it, what does that mean? It means it has more molecules. So my wife and I kind of laugh when we try a new food out and say, ah, wow, never tasted anything like that before. New molecules for our bodies. Isn't that great? <laughs> I love that. So I think it's a, a, I guess, a call to reflection upon um, our environment that we're living in because we live in this, you know, this very small slither of, um, of you know, the biosphere is where we get our key nutrients from, where plants get their key nutrients from mm. and how we survive. And so... I know modern scientists are talking about the fact that our topsoil is on a very, you know, yeah. short lifespan. And so I think anyone that's watching this video to campaign, to talk a bit, talk more about this, mm -hmm. to return to eating our own food, um, this movement, I think would be just, it's so important for our planet's health. And obviously, as we've spoken about our own health. If you're going to grow your own food, engage your children. Here's an example. Uh, we have some neighbors, they have four cute little girls, just, just Cheers, little girls. Great, great family. And my blueberry patch, I've, I have 12 blueberry bushes, is kind of between our two properties. So I started engaging the girls and help me maintain the blueberry plants a little bit, but mainly come and pick the blueberries. Yeah. And I got a, and her, her, their mother, the first time I did this, mother uh, gave me a call and said, God, Joe, thank you so much for having the girls uh, pick your blueberries. Because when I send them to school with fruit in their lunchbox, the fruit comes back. Yeah. Well, when I send them to school with blueberries that they picked, they always eat them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when the and when the and when the kids eat the food right from the plant and and taste its fullness and this freshness, it changes how they think about food. Mm. Absolutely. So important. And I think um, for us, I don't know, growing up, uh, we're so detached from from our food supply. And I mean, yes. like most of us don't even know what the plant looks like. Like what does even a blueberry plant look like? I, I personally, I'm, I, I'd be a bit hazy if I had to draw a picture. I don't know if I'd get it right. So, so I think it's yeah. high time to get um, back into nature. And um, I think you're totally right getting kids involved. I've seen, I've seen that with my sister's family. She has adorable children and the five-year-old, the garden is like her thing. She's in there and right. getting the cucumbers out right. and chopping them up and the pride in her face when she, she can present that piece of yes. um, fruit or veg. She's so proud. So that's a great point. And she, and she will be substantially healthier than her classmates yeah. who aren't yeah. doing that. Yeah. So <clears throat> good. Yeah. And, and I think for those um, that maybe don't have, you know, are living in apartments or don't have the time to build a garden, I think it's also important that we know that, we all know that we can vote with our wallet when we choose to buy mm -hmm. organic. Um, that says something mm -hmm. to, um, you know, the marketplace. The bar market will respond to that. And yes, so and, and for, for, do you have farm shares in Australia like we do here? Uh, so like farm co share. Co-ops? Co yeah. No, far, no, farm share. So okay, there's, you, you'd actually that. do a contract with a farmer to oh, say, yeah. okay, every month you're going to deliver me a box of whatever is ripe in your garden. And we huh. uh, we have done that. We, before we started growing our own food, we did that. Um, but now we're growing our own food, we don't do it anymore. But for those who don't have property like we have, um, mm -hmm. that's a viable option. And you're actually, as you said, putting your money where you think it's important. And that is real food. So, so, so important. We can't think of anything more important to talk about. Thank you so much for everything you've shared. It's I'm, I'm, I'm assuming people would have been horrified, but also filled with hope <laughs> in the sense of, yes. wow, these forgot, you know, these, these molecules that we have just maybe ignored or how important they are. We hope that more and more research will be done on this topic and what you're doing to spread this message. Wow. This is such an important thing to share. So thank you so much, Dr. Bozzano. It's been an incredible conversation. If people want to learn more about um, what you do, or is there a website or a book that you, that we can direct our audience to? 
So I do have a number of books. My latest book for consumers is called The Toxin Solution. And for doctors who are interested, healthcare professionals, uh, I have a new textbook called Clinical Environmental Medicine, where we lay out all the research on how toxins cause disease, how to diagnose them, how to get out of people's bodies. And those who have a health problem that would like to know the natural medicine approach, um, I have another book I co-authored with uh, Dr. Michael Murray called The Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine, and you'll find that as uh, useful. And for healthcare practitioners, um, we've got the textbook of natural medicine, that kind of uh, orangish one there. Yeah. And it turns out actually a lot of the a lot of the naturopathic doctors in Australia do use my textbook. How cool. And for those wondering, no, Dr. Pozzorno is not on Instagram. <laughs> 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 so you'll have to get his books. I think you're the first interview of someone that, that has written an encyclopedia. Yeah, I know. So. <laughs> what? <laughs> so it's a great privilege to have had you on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much you. for everything that you do. Appreciate it. Well, I hope you have been both frightened and inspired at the same time. <laughs> that was an, quite an incredible interview. I've yeah. been trying to, we've been obviously trying to connect with Dr. Bazzano for a long time. And he is a legend in the space. And so definitely check out his resources. He's a wealth of information. But what did you think of that interview? Like mm. there's so many things um, I'd love to hear from you guys about as to what really stood out to you and what you're going to be doing and what you'll be changing. Um, but yeah, what an incredible connection that we have with food that we need to restore yeah. and return to. So let us know the strategies that you'll be implementing from this call. Mm. Um, hit the like and subscribe button. And I think what more important information can we share with our friends and family than getting this information to them? So we've done this free so we can get this information out to as many people as possible. So. Hit that share button, send it to your friends and family, and we'll see you next week on the show. See you then.